Good day, everyone, and welcome once again to another episode of the Land Fricker Talks. I'm Chris, your host, and for those who are new, the Land Fricker Talks is a show that is focused on amplifying diverse viewpoints on AI. We strive to cultivate an inclusive discussion where different perspectives are shared, and we do this in an effort to reshape the conversation, to reflect a more balanced understanding of AI and its impacts in our world. Joining us today, we have Alexander Visharatin. He got his PhD degree from ITMO University in Russia. In 2020, he started working at Beehive as an AI engineer, Beehive AI. In his free time, he explores multimodal neural networks, which led him to his current position, working as an AI researcher at Playground AI. We're very, very happy to have you, Alexander, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for inviting me for the Africa Talks. So I will go and start uh, the presentation. So uh, let's begin the first. So as you probably know, uh, nowadays, uh, there are more and more uh, neural networks, large and small, that are designed to work in multiple languages. For example, this is not obviously a complete list, but uh, some of the most prominent recent works. So obviously for speech-to-text, we have Whisper, which works in 56 languages. So for text-to-speech, one of the models is Bark which is open source and works in 13 languages. And uh, more recent additions to this list is AIA, uh, model that model and data set that uh, has been uh, crowdsourced and uh, work in 101 language. So it is very uh, diverse set of languages and also a seamless M4T from uh, Meta AI who continues their work on ma massively multilingual models uh, for uh, several years now. And it also works in 101 languages. And the most recent uh, model that works uh, for 35 languages and can convert images to text. So captioning, question answering, even segmentation is Polygemma from Google, which has been released, I don't know, like maybe two weeks ago, max. Um, but uh, as you can see, it is not very large list of languages. So max is 101 languages. So let's go a bit closer to what we will be talking about today. So clip-like models. Obviously, it has all started with OpenAI Clip in 2021. And then uh, there were a lot of different Clip models of all kinds of sorts, like uh, EvaClip and others, uh, which work very well, produce state-of-the-art results, but only in English. Uh, there were multiple initiatives for language-specific models like Italian clip, Japanese clip, Spanish clip, which uh, focus only on one specific language. And there are multiple models that work quite well for multiple languages at once. For example, a uh, multilingual clip, uh, which works in more than 50 languages. And the model that has been released uh, in the second half of last year, uh, Siglip, they had multilingual variant, which supports uh, more than 100 languages. Again, quite high number, but considering that in the world we have more than uh, two, 3,000 languages, so it is uh, definitely not enough. So we need to have more. And uh, in the middle of last year, so almost a year ago, I had an idea after reading a paper from 
Meta. As I mentioned, they have been working on massively multilingual model for quite some time. So they created a family of models, which is called No Language Left Behind. Uh, and this family of models work uh, in 200 languages, including a significant amount of low resource languages, which is important because uh, most of the time uh, it, like these languages do not get remotely enough attention for them. And uh, this model uh, is encoder decoder. So basically it has encoder, which takes uh, language tokens and converts them to internal representation. And then this internal representation gets decoded into text. And uh, originally this model was designed for translation. So basically you can take text in one language and then uh, translate it to another one. And since this is encoder, decoder model, I thought that maybe I can just take encoder part from no language left behind and it will be model and then use it as an encoder for clip model. So the idea is very simple and straightforward. But in order to do it, uh, we needed to collect data because there is no large data sets or even like any significantly large data sets for all 200 languages. And my idea was that I want to collect the same amount of data for all the languages. So the data set is completely synthetic. And uh, what I did, I used Leon Coco data set and I started translating uh, short captions in MS Coco style from this data set to all languages from the data set. So from high resource to low resource, like every single language gets the same amount of data. This is very different from any existing data set because usually real data sets, so different languages are presented differently on the internet. And the internet is obviously the main source of data for, for training models. And since different languages are represented differently, so you get different amount of data uh, for different languages in your data set. But in uh, Leon, Coca, and LLB data set, every language has the same amount of data. It may be not the best possible data, of course, because it is translated, but still uh, it is very different that even for low resource languages, you have the same amount of data as for high resource languages. And uh, for collecting, I used the largest NLB model. So 3.3 billion parameters. And in order to optimize inference, I used ctranslate2 and onnx libraries to make it translation as efficient as possible because resources are limited and I needed to collect as much data as cheap as possible. So initially for the first version of the model, I collected 106,000 samples. And now this number grew to almost 900,000 samples. So, yeah. And uh, I will share the presentation later. And uh, the data set is openly available to anyone to use for their research purposes. The data set is licensed for non commercial license because I used an OB model to translate, uh, to generate this data set. And uh, NLB models are licensed for non-commercial purposes, only research. So because of that, all derivative work from NLB models had to be licensed the same way. And uh, for the first version of the model, uh, I used the VIT, uh, Visual Transformer models from OpenAI uh base and large variants and also uh in order to test how much scale influences the performance of the model 
I used huge uh, variant which was created by Open Clip community. And for text models, I used uh, all three models from an LB family, from the smallest one, 600 million parameters to largest one with 3.3 billion parameters. And as a result, what we got, uh, I got uh, state-of-the-art performance for image retrieval on cross-model 3600 3, data set. And this data set has 3,600 uh, samples for 36 languages. So it is more diverse than XTD10 data set because XTD10 has 11 languages. Uh, English plus 10 more. Uh, Cross-model 3600 has uh, more languages and it also includes as far as I remember, five low resource languages. And because of that, I was very happy with the results. And I presented, I wrote a paper and presented the results on one of New Reap's workshops uh, last year. Uh, although results were good, but they were not like not best. And I felt that like, I can do better and there is more that can be done. So one thing that encouraged me is that Google presented uh, their SIGLIP um, vision models. Uh, it is more advanced uh, clip-like model. So they all have like image encoder, image, deco uh, image encoder and text decoder, sorry. And they have uh, slightly different architecture and better uh, loss function. So they were uh, much better than standard clip models. And because of that, I decided that probably I can use vision encoders from these models to train a better versions of uh, NLB clip models. So this signified V2 version of NLB clip and uh, they are also called NLB SIGLIP in order to like uh, signify the most distinct feature of this uh, model, I don't know, model family, whatever you call it. Also for this uh, version, I collected more data, not as much as I have right now, but it has been around 500,000 samples by the time. And uh, after initial set of experiments, I discarded using uh, the largest model uh, from an LB uh, family because it uh, didn't produce uh, that much difference between large, between 1.3 and 3.3 billion parameters. So you have like two and a half times more parameters, but performances wasn't that different. So I decided that it is not worth computing resources to experiment with the largest model. And uh, so, yeah, I used only two variants and I called them like base and large. And what I got as a result, uh, I got significant, very, very significant boost in performance. So as you can see here, so even the base version of the model, which is twice as small, produced better results across both uh, cross model 3600 and XTD10, uh, produced better results than the than large variant of standard NLB clip. So it is very interesting. And uh, basically what it says that uh, by getting better vision encoder and more data, you can get like, much better results. And uh, this allowed uh, NLB clip models to become top one performing multilingual model in OpenClip uh, library. So OpenClip library is the most popular clip like 
collection of clip models, open sourced. Uh, it has around, I would say, 40, maybe even more now, uh, clip models. And some of them are multilingual. And at the moment, uh, NLB clip ranks top one in this uh, collection of uh, models. And uh, I open sourced, uh, not open source, probably more correct uh, word would be open weighted. So I didn't fully like describe, uh, I didn't fully release the code and all the recipes, but I released the models themselves on Hugging Face Hub. I didn't release code and uh, recipes mainly because I just didn't have enough time to properly go through everything and uh, compile everything together because uh, usually since this is my patient project, I do it whenever I have time and uh, resources to do it. So it is not very well structured, to be honest. So I uh, come up with some idea for experiment. I start trying it. I change a lot of code. So the, the code is uh, like huge mess. And because of that, like it was not worth releasing. So it, it was like a bunch of scripts uh, loosely connected together. So it was a bit chaotic because of that I didn't release that, but uh, models are fully available for anyone to use and try. And then uh, sometime later, uh, probably around, I would say December last year, January this year, I encountered the paper about Matryoshka representation learning. So basically the idea is that you have your large embeddings, for example, 600, uh, 768 or 100, uh, 1024. And then you use very small, like linear layers to make these embeddings smaller. So you convert uh, 1024 to, for example, uh, 500. Uh, 512, uh, 256, uh, 128, so on so forth. So you can have different resolutions for your embeddings. And what it gives you, first of all, it gives you, if you are planning to use it, for example, for like production systems, for vector databases, you can store your data in much more compact representations, first of all. And also, generally, it makes your model, if you also train like a backbone, it makes your model more robust to um, different because it has to operate in multiple um, in multiple resolutions at the same time, and because of that, it makes the model uh, more robust overall. And also, you uh, calculate multiple loss functions, so you have more loss to accumulate and propagate through the network through backpropagation. And what it allowed what it enabled also, it enabled huge improvement. So you can see here again, and I'll, like it might not be, oh, actually, sorry about that. I just realized that the these charts do not start from zero. I missed that. But anyway, this, uh, the increase in performance was noticeable. It uh, it was huge for the reason that it allowed NLB clip models to become state of the art model for both cross uh, model thirty six hundred and XTD ten in both image retrieval and text retrieval. Before uh, the models were not state of the art in text retrieval, but now, like at the current state, as far as I know. And NLB clip models are state of the art across uh, across the board. So basically, the these models are the best models you can get for multilingual text and image retrieval, especially in low resource languages. So 
for low resource languages. The difference between an LB clip models and any other model is like very, very large. And it also has been uh, uh, confirmed uh not not like not only by me you you shouldn't take like my word for it so obviously i would be biased and uh, towards like my models but it has been confirmed by different researchers who also work in this field of uh, multilingual retrieval models uh, independently from me and uh, yeah so this is where we stand right now and a couple of lessons that I learned along the way is that synthetic data works very well. It can work very well, but it doesn't work well for anything. So for example, uh, since we are here working for, with image and text representations, the actual wording, uh, the, uh, the order of words, how they're connected one to another, doesn't matter as much. For example, when we are generating text, it is much more important the like order of words, uh, specific words, uh, all these things. But for clip models, as long as you, for example, get the objects that are in the image right, and you get their po relative position more or less right, you get very good vectors and you can work with them. But in uh, text generation, when you have to produce text, uh, this, this may not cut it. This may not be enough and you would need to have something better, maybe more advanced uh, methods for synthetic data generation and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, even the initial results that I got uh, after a couple of months of work uh, showed that you can make useful stuff um, using not that much of resources. So I was very lucky that I also got support from uh, initial support from uh, Lambda Labs who provided compute resource, uh, compute credits. So I would be able to get started with the project, collect data and train these models. And later I got huge support from uh, ML Collective and they also provided computer resources so I would be able to continue working on this project and train uh, this SIGLIP variant of the model and uh, MRL, like Matryoshka representation learning variants of uh, uh, NLB clip models. So. But overall, compared to how much uh, computer resources and money, huge labs and uh, companies spent on training models, this is like nothing. But even with this little uh, uh, amount of resources, uh, you can make a difference, you can make uh very good models and uh, here on the screen you can see that one of the models like one of them not this is obviously the best performing model but it has been uh downloaded from hugging face hub 160,000 times in the past months and overall number of downloads is more than 200,000 by now so it this gives me a a very nice confirmation that uh, it is not just work for fun that I did because I wanted to like do some something that I deem useful. I see that this is actually a useful thing that people use it. People uh, do something like, obviously I cannot know what exactly people do with that, but they do something. They download and they put these models to use and this is very uh, gratifying on its own for me and also another thing that i learned along the way is that it is much much better to work in a team because while working on these models i had a lot of like errors a lot of bugs that i found like much later for example i 
train the model, it doesn't work, it doesn't work for, I don't know, like I do experiments for a long time. And then I completely randomly stumble upon like one thing in the code that I completely missed or like had a very subtle or not so subtle bug. Uh, but I'm pretty sure if I was working in a team, like, other people would notice these errors and uh, sometimes i even train a model for example right now uh mrl models uh, that are released on the hub they i found recently that they were trained basically not correctly so they are they produce good results they are like state of the art all the thing but in the way how they were trained, they were trained incorrectly. And now I'm actually in process of like retraining these models and also training a lot, even larger variant of an LB clip model to hopefully possibly make even better models for multilingual image and text retrieval. Thank you for your attention. It's really amazing how a passion project of yours turned into the state of the art for image and text retrieval, like <laughs> worldwide. You. That is that is really, really inspiring. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's also interesting to hear that it's a passion project. That's, that's really, it's very rare that you hear people say, oh, I just felt like doing this and I want to do that. Uh, 160K download is also really, really Wonderful. Do you have any idea what people are using these models for? Actually, the I don't, and this is one of like not drawbacks, but one thing, one of the things that could be like improved on the hub. That somehow I'm I, I'm not sure how, but it would be nice to have like some understanding. For example, how many like unique downloads uh, the model has, where people use this model? Because right now, like I see the number, but I'm not sure like who who does it, like what people use it for. Maybe maybe it would give a better like idea how to improve the model if I knew that uh, like the main, the primary, the current use case of the model is like this thing, and I would understand like maybe I could collect some more data targeted to this thing and make life of people who need this model better. But but still generally the the the, the scale of 160,000 it really yeah. goes to show that the data set is the the model is really being useful to people out there. That's yeah. that's really yeah. massive. So could you talk a bit about the matryoshka representation learning? Basically, uh, so you have the main vector, but you also have these yeah. other vectors that are smaller. Are they all trained jointly at the same time? Uh, originally in the like paper they released, they were trained jointly. But okay. uh, in our, yeah, but in my case, when I was training uh, the models, I in order to save like time and resources, I basically used uh, the uh, best um, trained model, uh, an LB clip, and I just added matryoshka layers for it to it and trained only these uh, layers matryoshka initially. Layers. Yeah, yeah, matryoshka layers. And then I, at some point, I started uh, unfreezing. Uh, layers of original model. And basically at some point, everything was training. But at first I, I used like pre-trained or fine-tuned model and started training uh, it from there. But it may not be the, as, as my current experiments show, it may not be the best way to train these Matryoshka representation layers. Because uh, what I can see right now, because I like, I continue training models, these models, and I I spend like this weekend basically like trying to make this largest variant work, and uh, I will continue 
like next weekend because during weekdays especially now uh i do not have like any free time but uh what i learned that if you take start training uh all layers jointly so original embeddings and matryoshka embeddings matryoshka uh, embeddings are training even faster than original layers so basically you have performance increase for matryoshka layers the they perform better than original layers when you're training them and this is very like counterintuitive and strange to see that like basically these are smaller layers they should be worse but up to some point they perform better and basically it, it feels like they are like saturating much faster because maybe because they are just smaller but anyway it is very interesting to see and i do not have like clear like clear uh, answer whether you want to train them together or first like train large like both ways work but for now i think that if you want to train matryoshka model and have these like smaller high quality embeddings you need to train like them all together jointly but if you want to have super good uh model which produces state of the art very best uh large vectors you do not need to like use matryoshka layers at least at first so first you you have to saturate main layers and then add matryoshka layers on top of it and then like continue training from that okay if you want the state of the art the best you 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 don't necessarily need to start training with the matryoshka layer you can start with something that's already very good and then improve on that yes yeah i see yeah Be because because right now i'm training this largest variant and uh, i started training uh, with matryoshka layers because uh, because i would it would be nice to have all resolu all resolutions in that perform very well and what i see right now that matryoshka layers they consistently perform better than original layers and original layers they saturate much slower probably because of their like, size and but i want to have a model that performs better than other nlb clip models so now i i will basically be trying to train this same model without matryoshka layers and see how it goes and see whether i can get like whether i can top my own best results from previous models that's pretty exciting i like how you are constantly pushing yourself to get better than your previous state of the art that's really yeah. really exciting any idea how much just increasing the data will help with this performance boost that you want so what if you just go from you know to x the data that you used uh, before double it or triple it from what i saw like up to this point data plays like huge role and it it is confirmed by basically every single research paper research blog every like frontier lab that you can like you can see everyone knows by now that da data scale matters a lot the more data you get the better results True. you obtain and if i was able i would be happily i would happily double the amount of data to get it to like better place the problem is that uh, i the idea of my data set is to collect uh like data in all languages uh at once so basically you have to like get one caption and translate it 200 times and this is like very resource consuming process and data collection is kind of slow and it requires uh, like significant amount of computational resources to just 
just collect the data. And uh, yeah, because of that, I can't really double the amount of data that easily. It was easy when I went, for example, from 100,000 to 200,000 and from 200,000 to 400,000. But now when the data is like almost 900,000 samples, like double it would take, I don't know, like if I was using one 800 GPU, it would probably take around like, maybe 20 days non-stop like working uh to collect this uh the same amount of data more than yeah, now. that is indeed pretty expensive e even now for like for training this larger variant of this model i i now spent like i don't have uh like compute grants for that so I, I'm now already spending my own money to like train this model. And uh, it, like I have my own like sort of mental limit for how much money I can spend for, for this like passion project of mine. So I'm already almost at it for these months. But luckily, also luckily for me, I still have support from ML Collective. And uh, thanks to them, I can, uh, basically I, I have everything set up for data collection there. So I can, every month I get some computational resources and I am able to just go to Google Cloud, start the instance and just start, not start, but continue collecting more and more data for the data set. And these, this uh, helps very much for uh, like increasing the amount of data. For example, last time I collected the data, I used uh, Cloud Compute from ML Collective to get 100,000 samples more for the data set. So slowly but surely I'm increasing, I'm growing the data set. That's that's really good. It's real, and that also speaks to what you said about the power of a team and working together. They provide resources and a lot more other things. That's wonderful. Yeah. Speaking of passion, I would like to know what motivated you to start this project in the beginning. I know you touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but could you talk more about why did you start this project? Basically, I wanted to do some research because uh, on my previous work, uh, it involved a lot of engineering, but I have a research background and I was kind of missing doing research. And because of that, I wanted to do some research project uh, in my free time. And uh, I thought like, what what can I do? Like, I obviously I don't have resources i don't have like that much also i don't have that much time because you have only this much free time because of that i thought about like what project can i do that can bring as much impact uh, with as little resources that i have when thinking about it i noticed the like kind of obvious thing for <laughs> everyone that multilingual models are very very like underrepresented overall everywhere and because of that i thought that it seems like this is a good place to start because basically the state of the art is not that high because not, not that many like labs and researchers work on that to like a uh, huge credit of uh, meta ai and google they make a significant effort to produce models and also release the models that other people can use that work in multiple languages. And yeah, and this was the kind of initial motivation. And then I stumbled across upon the like NLB paper, which basically like glued together the, like this idea of doing something multilingual. And yeah. But what keeps you up to still 
because you said you've been improving it, right? You Yes. you said you had the basic thing, then you went to meet maturation representation learning, and you're still you said like yesterday night you're still working on it. So what keeps you moving in that direction? Because I, I see that basically there is a room for improvement. So I see that like the performance of the model has not saturated like to the very top that uh, like basically you cannot go anywhere from these like insanely good results or whatever. Uh, like I see that the 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 very top performance the very top results from the model is around like 70 percent for english so for like the most popular language the best result is like 70 percent it is not it's very far from like 95 or like 100 percent so there is like huge room for improvement like why not improve if you if there is a room for that so and As as you know, and as we just touched on, uh, like data scale is the easiest thing to that can bring improvement to the model. And since for me, in terms of time, data collection doesn't take almost like anything because I have everything set up. I just need to like go start, and then after some time. I get more data that I can use to like additionally fine tune, improve the model. So this is why, uh, this is why like it is not that hard for me to continue working on that. And uh, from the impact, uh, multilingual models are still underrepresented. There are not still like not that many models which perform like insanely well. uh for many languages like there are models that perform well in like dozen dozens of languages but there are still like thousands of languages that are completely absent from the picture and uh i i can't do much about it because like i, I can't collect data for like for other languages that are not in the NLB model because it requires like insanely more resources because it re would require human involvement. It would require people going and doing something, collecting. And for example, uh, AIA project, they manually collect a huge data set to train a multilingual model that works in like 101 languages. And it was a huge community effort of like 3,000 people who dedicated their time and uh, they, they dedicated their time and uh, effort to like build it, to create it, to like clean it, to like, uh, and these kind of things can only be done uh, as a community. And I just do like whatever I can with like, the, that little that I have. I see that 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 makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you really leveraging the 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 power of synthetic data in the sense that you can actually just like launch the process, even though the process is expensive, but it's not as expensive as the human um the human efforts required to create the same amount of data. And then you just launch that process, and then you can get more data conveniently and focus on other things like how to. leverage the data. It's also interesting to me that um because I I don't know the quality of the translation, but it's interesting to see that in a in a task using that data, your model is still able to learn some things um, from the synthetic data to improve performance based on what what you 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 have shared with us. So that that speaks to the power and probably the viability of using synthetic data for some tasks, like you said. Yeah, and as, as I said, synthetic data, like the form of synthetic data that I use, it probably works well only for clip models because the like you can get very good text representation even from not very well 
translated text. For example, if uh, if you want to translate uh, a sentence, uh, the cat sat on a mat uh, in different language, as long as you got cat and mat and probably sat in like whatever in whatever order, even if the order is not right for the language you translated into, like you are still good. The representation will still be okay and it will basically like converge and give you good vectors in the end but if you want to generate text this is like completely different thing you have to have correct like order of words for different languages and languages are very different in structure in the way how words work uh, interact with each other the order the like even direction where the text goes because like in different languages, it goes like from left to right, from right to left. So it is a very different thing. And uh, I did some initial experiments with training, basically captioning model using this data set. The results were not that inspiring, but these were like very, very initial results. I didn't, I didn't have time and resources to go much further. Uh, but training maybe... captioning models, that's uh, you give it image and it predicts the text caption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, again, you know, you know, 200 languages and it didn't work that well, but maybe like maybe it can be improved. And obviously it can be trained to some extent to generate like some short captions. And for some languages, even that will be much better than nothing that exists. So, because some languages don't have anything and even something would be better than nothing. But I would want to, if I do something or like even for lower resource and underrepresented languages, I don't want to do like something, just like whatever that barely works. If I do something, I want it to be of a decent performance, not just like whatever, like take it, use it. It kind of works for your like low resource language. Like, I don't want that. I want to do something for, for like, if I do something, I want it to work well for all the cases, for all the languages. And this was the main motivation for an LB clip. So I wanted it to work well for all languages, not just one or like not for the most popular ones, but for all of them. I see. Let's break it down a little bit. So the task that you worked on is a thing called image and text retrieval, where you are learning, you are training the, um, the representation models as the encoder and decoder models to do this task of image and text retrieval. Or do uh, I, yeah. did I get something? The, these are only encoder models. So basically what okay. in, cli in clip-like models, you have image encoder and text encoder. Text encoder. Like, yeah, just two encoders. And what they produce in them, they produce vectors, like basically sequences of text, of numbers. And what you do, you compare these vectors and you, in the end, you have to make sure that these vectors are as close to one another as possible. So they basically image and text encoders produce very, very similar representations one to another. And uh, what it allows you to do, it allows you to basically encode image and retrieve the most uh, like similar text for it or uh, do I vice versa for like encode text and retrieve images. And it, ha it has like immense use for all sorts of databases. And the data set that you evaluated on, the, the, there's a thing called, um, the, you called it something, um, custom cross model, cross model cross. 360. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so what's that data set? What's the task that you're evaluating it on? Uh, this, uh, this task, uh, <clears throat> image and text retrieval. So basically okay. it it has like 36, uh, 3,600 pairs of images and text. 
And what you do, you encode all images, all text, and then you have like this like huge matrix, like 3600 by 3600. And then you find like top one result for every row or for every row or for every column. And you compare whether this is correct or not correct result. And uh, what you get in the end, you get a metric which is called recall at, for example, at one. So you get a top one result or, or you can get like top 10 results. It will be like recall at 10. So these are two main metrics that people use to like, compare the models. Obviously the trickiest one, the hardest one is retrieve, uh, recall at one. So you get the best result. And this best, like not best, this most similar result should be the the correct one so you do not have any room for like it may be like not top one but top two top three like recall it one is the hardest metric of them okay so you, your approach is with the nllb clip your approach is use the clips image encoder but swap the clips text encoder with an llb encoder yeah and then furthermore, use this synthetic data that you generated with NLB to further train these two encoders. Yeah. Otherwise, like embedding spaces for NLB model and for clip models, they are very different. So they have different embedding spaces. And because of that, if you just use them without any training, they like they don't match. You, you won't get any good vectors. And because of that, you like have to like converge and the best way um, to to do it to converge is not to converge them all together so basically you have to freeze one of two parts so you and usually the best way as it has been uh, discovered by researchers from google is to freeze image encoder so you do not touch you do not change image encoder and you and you train on the text encoder and in this case uh, we have like an lb uh text encoder and you try to push its embedding space towards uh image encoders embedding space and you align these two embedding spaces together to get uh, good vectors and did you train the image encoder at any point or you always froze the image encoder so what I do now, usually, uh, I start with training uh, only text encoder. And then when I see that it's saturated, when that it moved like as close as, as it can to image encoder, then I unfreeze image encoder and then train for a little bit more to basically like convert, like make them as close together as possible. So I train it, but I do not train it from the very beginning. So I'm, I usually train it at like very end. So it is like basically like final touch, which usually gives like sl not slight, but noticeable improvement in performance. Yeah. What I like about this approach is that you, you, you seem to, you're always, you're mostly working on the representation space. And I think that's what you said, that synthetic data is very, is useful there because it's mm -hmm. really model is just learning to extract useful representations. And so even with synthetic data, you can learn to extract good representations from the data. So that's a really nice spot that, that's been worked on. It allows you to basically to be more flexible, to not worry as much about like quality of data, for example, like for pure language models that produce text, you have to care about a lot about the actual text you produce. But for um, for these models, uh, like you you are okay with okay uh, text, not the not the very best. Yeah. But have you have you seen how these uh, trained encoders would perform in image captioning? Something that that produces text. Uh, I mentioned by like initial experiments. So basically, what I try, what I tried to do, I tried since again an LB clip is encoder decoder. So it the original model produces text. I just like I just discard like do not use decoder part. And what I 
tried to do, I tried to use image encoder and then text decoder. So basically standard like encoder decoder structure, but to train sort of captioning models for based on this approach. So it works, again, it works to some extent. It trains, it kind of works, but probably because of low quality of original data, it doesn't produce that good results. Or maybe I just didn't get to the point where it starts producing like re really good results, like ac of acceptable quality, because I spent on that probably like just one weekend or so. You're using the synthetic data to train the image encoder and text decoder. Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. I so I, it, it is basically the same, the same exact data set, but instead of like, usually I put image and text into model, but here I just put image and output text. So the data is completely same. Yeah, absolutely same data set, just a different like structure of stuff. Uh, I would be curious to see how like the the learned representations that you get from I guess the text okay to be the text side that would be interesting probably like the learned representations that you get from the text in this your in the NL, NLRB clip how they learned representations perform in a downstream task of a low resource language uh, just to see if the representations are actually that good that it can do well in a Loris's language for something like generation. I, I imagine for something that's non-generative, it can do really well, but I guess for generation, like you said, that's where the nuance comes in. Another, yeah, an another fun idea that I had like long time ago, but again, time and resources, uh, is to use uh, NLB text encoder for diffusion model. So basically you can, because diffusion models, they use text, they use clip text encoders for, for like embedding the text for like generation. And uh, basically I thought that you can just like take any pre-trained diffusion model and then you can just swap uh, standard clip uh text and coders yeah, yeah yeah and put the, like nlb ones just like fine tune to again align representations one with another and then you may have diffusion model that can generate uh images from like any description in 200 languages but again this is a hypothesis that i never had a chance to explore that's interesting. I like the ideas that you have. Um, they're really, really ideas worth exploring. I I also know about a research group that's trying to create some human human expert uh, benchmark data in some low resource languages. So I think uh, evaluating the, the your models with on those language human benchmark languages would also help to provide especially the very very low resource ones with those that are probably not in the the the, the benchmark data set that you're using would also help to to shed more light on the performance of of the multilingual encoder models that you have built on low resource languages this is really wonderful field and the last question is so what what are you looking forward to the next couple of months with this project? You said you're still optimizing, uh, improving, doing more work. What's the next? Or no, what 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 can we expect in the future? The next, I don't know, couple of months, the next year, basically, like since after I started work, my new position, I have even less free time to, to spend on the project. So it will get a bit slowed down, but hopefully rather recent, rather soon, I will be able to finish training larger models. So basically an LB clip XL variant uh, based on an uh, LB 3.3 billion. And uh, hopefully it will be 
even more state of the art than <laughs> anything else, all previous models. Uh, but at some point, I would want to explore uh, building this captioning model for 200 languages. Maybe it would require like better captions, so get some better captions, generate more high quality data and uh, spend more time to translate, to generate generate these like high quality captions in 200 languages and try to train captioning model using them. So larger model and captioning model. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Alexander Vishwaratin. It's been really lovely having you on the Lanfrica Talks show. Thank you so much for your work. It's really, really inspiring how you turn the passion project into a state of the arts for, especially for many low resource languages that have been neglected in the past by these um, multilingual encoders. It's very, very inspiring the work that you have done. And to think that you're doing it all as a passion project, just out of your own sheer passion for the field. That's very, very, very commendable. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for listening. Subscribe to our channel for more episodes. Have a wonderful day and bye.